Welcome to Convergence. Albert Einstein said, among the most difficult problems in all of physics is the Earth's magnetic field. My name is Michael Dorn. I'm a California attorney, and I argue that the Earth's magnetic field is among the most difficult problems in all of biology. This last video that we made, we talked about the quantum mind, which is about alternative, excuse me, alternating currents that lightning created as life formed 3.7 billion years ago with nucleotides that turned into a cloud pattern intelligently to dampen the Earth's magnetic field. So this is where a essay by Carl Sagan becomes relevant. Carl Sagan was a cosmo cosmologist. He wrote in his essay that the sun was like any other star. It was becoming a red giant and becoming more luminous. In fact, the sun became 25% or has become 25% more luminous, he calculated, since life formed 3.7 billion years ago. He asked in his essay, why are we not a gas ball now? Or why was early life not forming in a giant block of ice then? This is, in my view, why quant the quantum brain had to move out of the clouds. And um, for instance, why there's oxygen in the atmosphere it's a calculated response by the Earth's quantum brain. And there's many such reactions. The Earth is alive and intelligent. So the other thing I want to talk about is, and, and I have talked about it, is Kasparov playing Big Blue and, and, um, and how we can, with understanding the basic programming that occurred, when Earth first uh, had life on it, that we can then understand where intelligent design or where the, the quantum brain is now in, in life. Um, so this gets back to what Albert Einstein um, wrote to his friend, a beekeeper. And I, I wanna start with beekeeping. Um, there's a lot of different directions that we could go here. One, for instance, and, and this is something that I, when I was first thinking about this, wrote about this, is how uh, underneath the dam you'll have really cold water, nutrient-rich cold water coming out below the dam. And this is a habitat for salmon, which, and, and other certain migratory fish, that actually use Earth's magnetic field to migrate. Um, and the salmon have a very, uh, and trout, certain fish, have a very potent, um, when they defecate, when they, when they uh, urinate, it's very good fertilizer. And the fertilized uh, uh, soil under, in, in the stream bed supports plants and then the plants support insects and the insects become eaten by the trout and the, and the salmon and you get a, a ecosystem set up and um, it, for instance today we're talking a lot in the health sciences about uh, uh, plant toxins like whether you're talking about something like weed and gluten or um, uh, lectins that are maybe not so good for you. If you can imagine after huge periods of times of evolution, if insects were eating plants, the, the plants would evolve some sort of uh, toxin for the insects so that they, they wouldn't um, they wouldn't consume the plants. And, and, a, and a classic example of that is bark on a tree to prevent the insects from eating the wood. Um, yeah, this didn't happen, 
or this doesn't happen. And the insects eat these these plants, and the and the and the and the trout or the the salmon eat the uh, the bugs, and then you get this ecosystem, and the ecosystem becomes really important because there's a selective pressure that a living earth puts on having that ecosystem. And this is why I have been preaching uh, for a long time about the problem with dams is because they set up a artificial signal that a living earth over huge time scales has evolved these ecosystems to respond to. So for instance, if in the nearshore oceans there's uh, this, this signal from cold water, the, the, the biosphere of the nearshore ocean, the carbonation levels, the biosphere reads that as a glacier. And the biggest problem with a glacier is snowball earths and snowball earths were were a problem. So if that's what, what was being read, the feedback, the biological feedback with decarbonation and surface lows was that you would see heat as, as fed back. And that has been a huge problem here in California with the fires. But if on the other hand, during the dry season, instead of having melting glacial ice, you have no flow or low flow, then, um, then there isn't this feedback of heat. And, and so when you build a dam, the, the, the nearshore oceans read that and respond to that mechanically as, as if there's a glacier there because during the rainy season, it's the 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 rain is being captured just like snow would be and then during the dry season the dams release and it's just like the glaciers melting in the warm part of the season and so the biosphere is reading that as um, as, a, as a glacier and it's feeding back heat so this is just one example that that I've been talking about but I'd like to talk about in this, in this context of the fact that the sun has, has gotten brighter and early life was nucleotides and clouds. And th there, there was the DC field part of it, which is where you, you can see this today in the way that electrophoresis causes banding because you you see the whole solution set of what supercooled cloud droplets did in a calculated way. You had this model and the solution set. But today, because the sun is so much brighter and or so much more luminous, maybe a better way of putting it, 25% more luminous, the the nucleotides in cloud doesn't work anymore. Carbonation in clouds still works, and that affects the, the freeze rate and the, the morphology of ice crystals and that sort of thing. But the, the nucleotides don't. And over time, the nucleotides became much more complex, and we have with the nucleotides, or we had with the nucleotides and cloud droplets, this ability, particularly with the alternating currents, that come from lightning and the crescendos or the resonances from lightning um, against Earth's magnetic field, that you could get these quantum behaviors and then altered quantum states could then have a sort of consciousness to them. And then that is the building blocks of life so therefore, you sort of get a, a, a reassemblage of the past in the present. And, and then that gets to um, 
this letter that Albert Einstein wrote to his beekeeper friend. And so for today's um, uh, kind of uh, magnetosphere life form, I want to focus on the bee, the honeybee. My father was a beekeeper. I tried it, I got stung too much. But um, I have become pretty familiar with beekeeping and bees. And uh, there's just like anything else now, there's a convergence occurring because so much research has occurred with the bees. Um, so an example, recent research where um, it's been well known or it's been well thought that bees used a magnetic field to, to navigate. And uh, a Canadian researcher here I just read about, she basically demagnetized the bee and, um, and after training the bee to go to a food source, demagnetized it and then it, it didn't work anymore. The bee wasn't able, the, the worker bee wasn't able to find the food source. So let me talk a few things about the, the bee and what's really cool about um, the bee in terms of, um, of what it does. And, and how, in my view, it's one example of the quantum brain. So, you know, when life f first formed from nucleotides, you had many nucleotides uh, that combined to provide a solution set to modulate or dampen the Earth's magnetic field. Again, the problem is too much of a magnetic field, you capture everything and you get Jupiter, you get Saturn, you get a dead planet. You get storms that go for hundreds of years like a red dot on Jupiter. It's a dead planet, it doesn't, it's not alive. If you, if you have too little magnetic field, magnetic sphere, excuse me, too little magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field, then you become Mars and it gets stripped away the atmosphere gets stripped away, and again, a dead planet. So this implausible complexity that we see was and has been solved by life, and particularly uh, the quantum brain, the intelligence of nucleotides and cloud droplets. And how it's expressed today is a little bit different because, well, the sun, a star, has become a red giant. It, it's moving towards that anyway, and it's become more luminous, so nucleotides in clouds didn't work anymore. Um, the plant, planet has changed and it, different responses have had to be made um, to respond to the changing inputs. And so one example is the oceans have become more saline because the oceans, because the rain, rain feedbacks over time, the salty oceans are more conductive and so then the electrical feedback, the global electric circuit, has then been able to handle a more luminous sun. That's just one example. But getting back to the honeybee, one of the cool things is in, in the body of the honeybee, this is where there's um, bits of iron. Um, and this iron is magnetized and you have the buzzing of the bee, which is a frequency. Um, it's in a frequency that can align with what's going on with Schumann resonance or electrical, uh, again, alternating currents in the, um, in the atmosphere. The bee basically, as it flies, its wings flap and creates static charges. You also have, again, the, the buzzing and the mag magnetic material in, in the, the thorax or the, the body of the, of the bee, and it, it gets itself charged, becomes charged. And then it comes to a flower, and the flower has the, the, um, the nectar, which is a food source. It's where, for instance, the, the iron would come from. Um, it's also sugar, which is very important for when you're talking about something which has a neurological 
component, a nerve component, because it's, uh, it requires a lot of energy to, um, it takes a lot of energy for the, for brain processes to occur because what the, what life does now is it recreates the electrical conditions of the past inside a cell that were in clouds so that the complexities that were evolved and created in the clouds can then be expressed in the, the basically the machinery of the bee. So you have to have um, gated channels in the cell to create potential differences with ions. Um, and all that takes a lot of ATP, it takes a lot of energy to, to push these chemicals back and forth across membranes to create uh, the electrical conditions in a cell that are very, is very much like what was in the atmosphere. So the bee, bee comes along and it's also a, after pollen. Now pollen is, um, again, early Earth would have had nucleotides which were basically naked and could do, could, could alter phase change rates and calculate it could be feedback and, and, and model at the same time. And that was basically more of a male aspect. Pollen, as to plants, is very much the same thing as the male aspect of, of, of plants. And so you have nectar and pollen and the bee goes and its electrostatic charge is different than what the plant is and it literally attracts the pollen into these little receptacles that the bees have. And so this is very much a symbiotic relationship where you have something that's associated with the soil, can't move, doesn't have a brain, brain cells, and whereas the bee moves, it has brain cells. So you get this symbiotic relationship between the plant and the bee. I believe the, the bee has, the bee has a, a brain that is shaped like this, kind of a, I don't want to say bean, but, but it's, it's got a curve to it. And what it reminds me of a lot as somebody who studies tropical storms, it reminds me of the dirty side of the storm where you're going to get cirrus production and again, which is ice. It's, it's, a, it's the actual ice part of the storm going over the top of it and reflecting heat back from convection down into the storm. And it's at like 200 watts per meter square cirrus clouds are. Where, whereas uh, fog reflects 100 watts per meter square. And then the greenhouse gas effect that we've all been talking about, that's four watts per meter square. So it's very, very huge. And to not understand that carbon dioxide's role in, um, in the clouds in terms of the organization of clouds and where the cirrus occurs is, is a huge mistake in the climate change debate. And then it's compounded by the fact that the system is dampened, it's alive, and, and that is further confounding of what exactly is going on with human activity. And, and with, with that thought, again, I think it's important for me to talk about the Carboniferous, and, and this is a period of time when most of the coal most of the uh, things that we're talking about burning as far as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, actually were sequestered by life. And, and uh, when this happened, carbon dioxide levels were 1,500 parts per million compared to you know, the concern we're having now in the, in the 400 range of 400 parts per million. And many so-called skeptics are saying, well, 
if we had carbon dioxide levels that high, why is it such a big deal now? Well, it's a big deal because during the Carboniferous, there was Pangaea over the South Pole. 90% of lightning occurs over the tropics and, um, and, and, and occurs over the land. Um, and it's because of the mechanisms of lightning it, it, where over the oceans you get couplings and you get movement of currents, whereas over land there's no coupling uh, available and you get shorts and you get plasma behaviors and then lightning. And, and because you had more lightning or because you have more lightning today, the amount of carbon dioxide to dampen and create the right type of earth magnetic field is much different than it was during the Carboniferous where there would have been less lightning because the land was in, in the tropics and, um, and, and, and lightning occurs mostly in the tropics over land. And so you had less lightning, you needed more carbon dioxide to dampen. And now you fast forward, not only do you have land that's over the tropics, but you also have a slowly more luminous sun to deal with. And so the, the amount of carbon dioxide, the signal to noise problem that you have, how do you create these intelligent feedbacks that uh, create pathways in the subterranean, heat the pathways, uh, heat the subterranean. Um, how do you have the correct amount to dampen the Earth's magnetic field? It's much different than it was at that time. So the B, which is an interesting example of where the the where the quantum brain is now. I mean, I would suggest that we are the quant that we are the we are the uh, top predator or the, the top, the top uh, quantum brain in the whole chain of things. But we, have, we, we keep bees and we have agriculture. And uh, what bees do, um, and, and let me direct, digress a little bit there too, um, we, we know a lot more about uh, the genetics of bees. So people have uh, now studied the different parts of the bees and they've studied the bees genome and they know when bees became social. And it was about 80 million years ago. And a lot of people would say, well, there is nothing very interesting going on 80 million years ago. Well, actually uh, there was. And um, so about 110 million years ago, in my view, over the South Pole, there was an asteroid that hit the South Pole. Uh, we know the asteroid is there. Uh, that part has been discovered, but no one has dated it yet. And uh, I dated it 110 million years ago. Why? Because, and this is an asteroid as big as the one that hit the, the uh, the Yucatan. It's a big asteroid. And yet there wasn't an extinction event with it at all. In fact, for the next uh, 30 million years or so, the Earth's magnetic pole never shifted, even though it shifts quite a bit now, and at least in geotime. So for 30 million years, you had this period where the Earth's magnetic field didn't flip. And in, in my view, it has to do with a conductive pathway being created with that asteroid strike where you get a heating of the Earth and then you get a conductive pathway. And that actually, because the asteroid impact uh, corresponded to the geographic South Pole in terms of the converging isobars and just the shape of the Earth's magnetic field, it 
caused it to the Earth's magnetic field to be more stable. And, um, and that's exactly what happened for 30 million years or so. And, and these, these, uh, these uh, periods, long periods of time where the Earth's magnetic field doesn't shift have a name for them. Well, the, the social behavior of honeybees started to occur when the Earth's magnetic field began to shift again about 80 million years ago. And then strangely, with the impact of in, in the Chukula, uh, it, with the one that killed the dinosaurs, this did not change um, the social behavior of bees or didn't, didn't result in anything interesting about bees. And it's because, in my view, the bees became even more important in terms of uh, tying in with plant behavior, tree behavior, uh, any flowering type of, of, uh, of plant, and allowed it to basically have a quantum brain, allowed plants to have a quantum brain. And that then results in carbonation levels flowing down rivers and having this intelligent design to them being able to shift in a calculated way, in a highly intelligent way. Bees are also interesting um, because of this social behavior where you have the worker bees being as important to the hive as, you, you know, you just don't have a, a, a drone and a queen. You have a, an amplification of the importance of the worker bee. You also have uh, honey being produced, which is is a, a food source during the winter time, so that right when pollination needs to occur in the spring, it can. You have a production of sugar relative to the colony that. Um, that that feeds something that's intelligent that's that has nerves and um, so again you not only have the the food to pollinate in the in the spring but you also have uh, a, a food source which is high in, in in energy so that thinking can occur so this is a, a very calculated type of thing that the bees allow Again, the, the navigation is with uh, a magneto. And, um, and so that if the Earth's magnetic field changes, that causes some confusion, and um, it, which might result in, in actually the bees finding things, finding food sources, and changing the landscape of where pollination occurs and where plants are and where plants are drawing uh, nutrients out of the earth, again, in a very design calculated way. And, and so the quantum brain is able to, as, as one aspect of it, is able to move around and be part of the solution set for a living earth. Um, I, I, I do these videos on purpose just off the top of my head or, or trying to talk in a reasonable way rather than writing it because sometimes just saying things, it's, you, you get closer to what you're trying to say. And I want to keep it conversational. And so this is, this is purposeful for me to do it this way. Um, I think that science doesn't necessarily have to be out of reach to the normal person, especially if you can talk about it in a simple way and you're speaking the truth about how things are working. Um, but it is difficult material, I believe, because uh, it's, it's abstract in time and space that are of huge scales. It's also um, a convergence where we're starting to see things from different branches of science, whether you're talking about people who study the genetics of bees, 
or look at the bee body parts and see how they've evolved over time, see how some bees are single creatures associated with 